Um, that's a great pleasure and honor to be here, and uh, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this uh, talk is about some recent results um, on decentralized control, and specifically the, the new piece is, is this state space piece. So I'm going to talk about two topics. The first will be linear systems, and the second will be Markov processes. And uh, those two topics are, are sort of picked for me because in centralized control systems, in general control theory, in both of those areas, we have very, very good theory. We have existence conditions, we have characterization of optimal controllers, and we have algorithms for finding them. And when you go out of centralized control into decentralized control, you have many controllers. Then suddenly, lots of the nice properties that you know go away. We don't have nice algorithms anymore. If you just think about the simplest possible problem in linear decentralized control. Um, you know, the example I always use is some kind of formation control problem, where you've got a string of vehicles or an array of vehicles, and each vehicle is measuring the distance to its neighbors. And they're trying to move in order to minimize the mean square relative position error. If every vehicle knew everybody else's sensor information, this would be what we'd think of nowadays in control as easy. We'd have linear dynamics. We'd have a Gaussian model for disturbances. We'd have some quadratic cost function. We'd be minimizing this mean square error. And we could solve this using 1960s technology, Kalman filtering and optimal control. As soon as you put this decentralization constraint, where everybody only knows the relative positions, relative position measurements to their own neighbors, the problem becomes really hard. I mean, there's no known solution. There's no formula for the optimal controllers. There's no algorithm that can effectively and tractably compute the minimum achievable mean square relative position error which is kind of astonishing. Right? And you, you kind of want something like that. right? You want a lower bound on what's achievable, because when you do your design, it's not necessarily that you're going to implement the optimal controller. But at the same time, if you come up with some controller, you don't want somebody to come along a few years later and say, my controller performs better than yours. You want to be able to say, well, no controller can perform better than this number. And I get close to it. So, so what is known? Um, uh, so this is, might be the, the simplest decentralized control problem. Linear dynamics, discrete time, A and B are just matrices, C is just a matrix, W is IID, discrete time, Gaussian noise, U is a control input, X is a state, and Y is a measurement. And of course U and Y are vectors, we might split them up into channels. And then we'd set up a two-player problem where player one chooses u1 and gets to measure y1, and player two chooses u2 and gets to measure y2. Um, again, if it's centralized, you know a whole bunch of stuff. You know that if you're trying to minimize a quadratic, expected average quadratic cost function, the optimal controller is linear. You know, uh, furthermore, that it's actually rational. So it, there's a, not only is it linear, so it's represented by a transfer function, but that transfer function is actually a rational function of frequency. You also know this little word here, which I stuck in there, which is convex. Um, and that goes back to some earlier work that we did that I won't talk about very much today, where we ask ourselves the question, for any given controller, any given linear controller, there's a map, a resulting closed loop map from uh, disturbance w to some function to say x or to say y or to any other linear function of the state. And then you say, well, let's let, let all possible 
that control a variable over all possible decentralized controllers or all possible centralized controllers and look at the set of such achievable closed loop maps. And that set's convex. And that's at the heart of what enables you to do all these computations and find optimal controllers. You also know much more than just these things. You actually know explicit formulae for these rational controllers. You know about Kalman filtering, and you know about separational principles, and you know about Riccati equations, and linear matrix inequality. You know a whole bunch of stuff. In the decentralized control, all of this goes away. Right? For this problem, just with two players, A, B, and C, given matrices, it's known that the optimal controller isn't linear. Right? There are nonlinear controllers do, that do better than any linear controllers. And this is a, uh, a, a classic example that goes back to the 70s. And so then you start to say, well, if it's not even linear, and convexity goes away, and then you can't even ask questions like rationality, I mean, what can you say? What can you prove? And uh, you know, what can you do? So one thing we've, we've spent several years doing now is trying to look at problems where you know, the bad things don't happen. It doesn't happen that the, the general problem, that the decentralized control problem has a nonlinear optimum for every possible A, B, and C, but just for some. And then the question is, are there what, what A, Bs, and Cs result in tractable optimization problems. So that's one question you can ask. And we address that question. We spent a lot of time working on that problem and figuring out that there were some that were nice and some that were useful as well as nice. And here's an example of such a situation. Right? So here I've got uh, a two-player state space discrete time system. and. Uh, uh, it just has this special structure that the A matrix is block triangular and the B matrix is block triangular. And here V is IID noise, and it splits into V1 and V2, and V1 and V2 are independent. And we're going to have a situation where player 1 gets to measure x1, and player 2 gets to measure both x1 and x2. So this is a constraint on the information that's available to player 1. So player one's policies are always going to look like this. They're going to be some function of time. At time t, u1 of t is going to be some function of time and the past history of x1s. And player two is going to be some, at time t, his action is going to be some function of time and the past history of x1s and x2s. And we'll use the usual uh, quadratic cost function. So you just, it's helpful to have a little block diagram in your mind here. Um, the block diagram is this. So this is the dynamics of system one. This is the dynamics of system two. This arrow says that system one affects system two and not vice versa. Uh, this arrow says that controller one gets to measure states from system one and stick an input into system one. And that input also affects system two. Controller two gets measurements from both system two and system one and sticks an input into system two. So just think about this diagram as all the information flowing from left to right. Right? Controller 2 knows everything, controller 1 doesn't. But controller 1 affects everything. So this is the kind of system for which you can prove, and we weren't the only people to prove for this particular class of systems, um, that the optimal controller is linear. Um, we actually proved that the optimal controller was rational. We actually gave an algorithm for computing the optimal controller via infinite dimensional convex programming. And the convex bit of that is really good, and the infinite dimensional bit is not so happy, because um, it means you have to work in a basis, and you have to compute the optimal controller restricted to that subset, that finite dimensional subset, and then you get something that converges. But you don't get an explicit formula. You don't know, we didn't know anything about separation structure of this controller. So even though we can compute it, find an explicit little MATLAB computation which will give us the impulse responses of the optimal K1 and K2 here. All we're looking for is two impulse responses. We don't know anything about their structure. How many states do they have? What are they trying to do? When you think about control, it helps to think about what controllers are trying to do. You think about controllers which are running little filters that are trying to estimate the state of certain systems. And then they're trying to optimize some cost function individually. So what do you guess is the optimal controller for this? 
Well, here's a good guess. The optimal centralized controller for that problem, if both players can measure both x1 and x2, is just this static state feedback gain. There's some Riccati equation that x satisfies. There's some gain matrix, which f, which is in terms of x. And then u of t is just some matrix times x of t. And so you guess, well, player 1 doesn't know x2, and player 2 knows both x1 and x2. So why don't we just look at this formula here, split it up into player 1 and player 2, and just say, well, player 1 doesn't know x2, so just replace that with the usual MMSE estimate, the usual Kalman filter estimate. Uh, seems very reasonable. And then player 2 knows everything, so he just does what he normally does. And this is arbitrarily bad. It's a common heuristic. You see it in lots of papers. But you can even destabilize a stable system with this. This is the, the example. So it's stable. Uh, this is actually not stable, but this is a, 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 we can easily do the example with a stable system too. But this is a simple system. Um, and this is the gain. And you can work out the closed loop dynamics for player two are actually unstable. So that's not right. As I said, we know the optimal control is linear, rational. We can compute it. This is what it is. Right? So this is a new result. Um, at least I think it's new. I always boldly say this is a new result. And then somebody says, did you know about the such and such paper in 1965? <laughs> they did much better work than you. And um, so you know, if you do know such a paper, come and tell me. Leave out that they did much better work a bit of the <laughs> sentence. But, you know. but this is the optimal controller. Uh, player 1 does exactly what we said player 1 should do. Right? It replaces x2 with the Kalman filter estimate. So this is the Kalman filter estimate in the sense that it's the minimum mean square error estimate of x2 conditioned on the information available to player 1, which is just the history of x1. Uh, player 2 does something different. Right? Player 2 also computes the same estimate, x2 est, even though he knows the state of system 2. And then he has the usual, this is f, by the way, is the usual centralized optimal controller gain. It's not a special computation. J is some other rather special matrix, and it multiplies the difference the in between x2 s and x2, the estimation error. Now you can anthropomorphize. You can say, well, what are the players doing? Right? And you can say, well, what's going on is that player 2 knows that player 1 doesn't have full information, and so should correct for mistakes made by player 1. Hmm? And the magnitude of those mistakes are determined by x2s minus x2. That seems like a reasonable piece of anthropomorphization. Um, you can also see some nice things. So if system 2 has no noise, then um, um, x2s is equal to x2. And then this is exactly putting in the, the input that the optimal centralized controller does. So it does the right thing in that circumstance. You can also see that both player controllers are dynamic. <coughs> and they both have the same number of states. They both have the number of states equal to the number of states of system 2. And so you have this magic idea that for state feedback optimal control, the number of states is 0. And that for output feedback optimal control, the number of states is equal to the number of states of the plant. And this is the decentralized version, or a decentralized version, of that result in this special case of this particular triangular two-player problem. So um, uh, just to be explicit about what these x's and y's and j's and stuff are, x is the usual Riccati equation, f is the usual gain matrix. And y is some other Riccati equation, and j, which enters in here, is some other gain matrix. So if you have a, a deep intuitive feeling and prefer staring at these long algebraic expressions, you should now feel this lift coming in within you and have, feel this warmth because you've got these big expressions. Some of you will be revulsed, repulsed by such expressions, and I'll try to minimize showing them to you. Um, but we have formula for everything, but I'm going to try not to expose you to them. Um, OK. So, um, so I want to tell you how you prove this. 
I want to just tell you how you prove this. This is an incredibly sophisticated audience, and I figure I can just actually tell you all the details of the proof, and I will. Um, but feel free to heckle and say, what, or don't do that. Um, and then I'll tell you about more general versions of this result. I'll tell you about uh, you know, when we can find explicit formally and explicit structural descriptions of decentralized control problems. And we can't actually always do it. We can't actually always do it even in those special cases which people know about. The special cases that we know are where the optimal controller is linear and the problem is convex, the quadratically invariant cases, we can't do all of those. The stochastic theorists like to think about partially nested systems. We can't do all of those either. But we can do quite a bunch of them. Um, and I'll also tell you at the end, as I said, some Markov process results. So what you can do in the general, well, general meaning finite state space or nicely measurable state spaces, um, just a general decentralized nonlinear optimal control problem. Structural results again. Who needs to estimate what and who's correcting for whose mistakes? And that's really the philosophy here a little bit. It's not so much that, I mean, I think these are very interesting problems. They're unsolved problems for 40, 50 years now. And that's, that's kind of cool if we can make some progress and chip away at them and get new results. But I think there's a bigger picture as well, which is that we really do want to implement decentralized systems and not always for linear systems. And you're not going to compute optimal controllers in general. Right? But knowing the structure tells you something about how to do design. Mm. Tells you about what you should be trying to estimate, even if you can't estimate it exactly, what your belief state should be. So that's the story. That's the motivation. Uh, I'll, let me tell you how you prove this result. OK. Um, uh, first of all, linear dynamics. And now I've just introduced this output z of t, which is just the thing that, that enters into the cost. So we've got the usual cost here where uh, we're trying to minimize the expected value of the norm of some linear function of the state. And c and d are not structured right, in any way. So the cost can couple between the states and between the different systems. Right? This is the same two-player problem we had before. So A is block lower triangular, B is block lower triangular, and W is IID and independent between the channels. And for this, we just write this. We just take these dynamics and write it in this nice, explicit, standard two-player way, and not, not two-player, two-input, two-output way. But we look at two outputs of this system, Z and X, and there's some matrix transfer function times two inputs, uh, the noise W and the uh, and the control input u. And this p is some matrix transfer function, and it's this. Right? And you can just see immediately that it's this. The, obviously, the output of zi minus a inverse times ib is just x. And then this just gives me x, uh, z and x, where I've added on d to get this d. Uh, and I should say that this z is, of course, not this z. I just abuse notation. This z is the transfer function, there's the Fourier variable, and this z is just some vector. That allows us to write the problem in the LFT framework. The LFT meaning linear fractional transformation. So I've got P11, P12, P21, and P22 are the four blocks of this two by two block transfer function. And the, the, the block diagram kind of says it all. It says that Zy is this matrix times Wu. Y here is the vector of control measurements. It's just x. And the controller takes y and sticks it into u. And the controller is required to be structured. Right? The controller is required to be lower triangular, block lower triangular. And you should think now that these things are all transfer functions, and so is k. Or you should think that they are impulse responses, whatever you prefer and are happier with. And then if you say, well, I close this loop and I get a map from w to z, what does that look like? It looks like this. Z is equal to P11 plus P12K times I minus P22K inverse times P21 times W. Um, oops. K is stabilizing. That's something we want. Um, 
K is block lower triangular. That's our decentralization constraint. And this norm is the usual H2 norm. It's the L2 norm of the impulse response. And this is uh, simply uh, a transfer function. So you've got to minimize this, subject to the constraint, these two constraints, picking K any impulse response you like. Now, this looks horrendous because of this, it's a horrendous function of K. Um, but it's not actually horrendous because you know that if I kill that block lower triangular constraint on K, this is just the LQR problem. Right? So you know that there is an answer for it, and there's an explicit answer for it, and then that K turns out to be an impulse response, which is just a pulse, right? which is just a static gain. So the bit that's going to make this miserable is the block lower constraint. Without the block lower constraint, it's easy. And with the block lower constraint, it's hard. So that's all we're doing, is we're taking a problem which is classical, adding this block lower triangular constraint, and then seeing can we solve it. Um, you can prove certain things, by the way, if this is a different constraint. If this is, instead of block lower triangular, if this is block diagonal, uh, you can prove that, subject to a whole bunch of technicalities and caveats, that this problem is NP-hard. So not any constraint makes this work. The block lower triangular constraint is a special one. Um, OK, let's, let's look at this. Uh, this problem is the usual LQR problem. Maybe we should start, and I plan to start, by um, asking how we solve this. Right? Just look, look at the classical theory to solve this problem. And actually, this is classical in a real, really, really classical sense. This goes back to the 1930s. This goes back to Wiener. Uh, he didn't write it in this notation, but he did it. And it's just, uh, uh, I said I wouldn't expose you to lots of algebra, so let's look at it a piece at a time. Right, there's a bunch of steps. Right? There's a, we start off with this problem, we convert it to this problem, we convert it to this problem, we convert it to this problem, we give us the solution. Right? And the steps are all kind of easy. The first step is called Euler parameterization. It's, it takes this problem and says, let's change variables, and then we will convert it to the minimum of, so here h2 is the set of square summable impulse responses, minimum over all q of the norm the two norm of n plus mq, where n and m are two transfer functions. The fact that you can do this is actually really easy. It goes like this. Right? You take this original problem, you just change variables to be q is ki minus p22k inverse. Right? So we've got this problem where we're given four transfer functions, p11, p12, p21, and p22. We change variables, and then we have this problem. Uh, oops. And then we have this problem. P11 plus P12 QP21. And the only caveat, well, there's two caveats. First is you have to prove this is a bijection between Q and K, so this change of variables works. And once we've found the optimal Q, we can get back the optimal K. And the second thing you have to prove is that this K is stabilizing, corresponds to Q being stable. And both of those things are classical theorems that go back to Zames and Euler, and, uh, uh, and they're true. This is actually more complicated if P is not stable, and I'm, I'm going to pretend that I'm not going to talk about that case. The results I present actually do hold in that case, and that, that's, all, that's all fine. We actually don't do quite this change of variables for this problem. We do one more little trick, and that is we absorb Z times P21 into Q. Oops. Um, and that means that I end up with a problem which is minimize the norm of P11 plus Z inverse P12 times Q, subject to Q is stable. And the reason I absorb Z P21 in there is that Z P21 is actually invertible. Right? So this also is, uh, once you give me a K, I can work out what Q is. Once you give me a Q, I can work out what K is. <laughs> so I'm just going to call this thing N and this thing M. And the reason Z P21 is invertible is because this is state feedback. So people classically call this a two-block problem. Right? There's nothing on the right-hand side of Q. Um, so now we've got a, what's a rather nice convex program. Right? It's infinite dimensional, but your job is just to find a square summable, oops, square summable 
impulse response Q. To minimize the norm of this, where this is just the two norm, and N and M are given impulse responses. And the, the, the multiplication M Q is, of course, convolution. Uh, so it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a quadratic program. It's an infinite dimensional quad quadratic problem. And when I said we could compute the optimal controller, right, this is how we did it. Right, before we did this, uh, last year or the year before, we just solved this convex program in a basis for Q, and that gave us a Q, and then we inverted the change of variables to get K. Um, and that's a numerical thing, but not an analytic thing. OK, so what do you do with it next? is you say, well, this is a convex program. It has optimality conditions. The karush kern tucker conditions, it's infinite dimensional, doesn't matter. And they look like this. And they shouldn't look too bad to you, right? This is, remember, if this was the least squares problem, this would be a q plus b. And the optimality conditions would be a transpose a times x plus a transpose b has to be 0. Here we've got a subspace constraint, so they have to be in the perp space. And this looks exactly like that. Um, and Q has to be an H2. Uh, H2 perp is, of course, the, uh, the anti-causal square sum of all impulse responses. So uh, this is reasonable. We could prove it. I think I have a slide which says it explicitly, but that's OK. Um, the good thing about this is that this is now linear equations. Right? You've got to find a Q which satisfies two linear constraints. It has to like this linear function of Q has to be in the subspace, and Q has to be in a subspace. So you can solve this explicitly. There's a solution, which is why this goes back to Norbert Wiener via spectral factorization. And an explicit formula in terms of this thing called L, and this P plus is the projection onto positive time. This is the point at which you should say, okay, well, I don't need to follow all the details of this formula, and you don't. I just want to tell you explicitly about you know, what L is, because that's how you get the McCarty equations. Right? I give you some transfer function, C, Z, I minus A inverse B plus D. And spectral factorization, what it does is it gives you an L. So the L star L is equal to M star M, where M is this. And both L and L inverse are in H2. They're both square summable. They're both stable causal transfer functions. And explicitly, it gives it to you. It gives it to you L in terms of a Riccardi equation. So there's x is the Riccardi equation, f is the gain. And uh, then this is just a, an explicit rational transfer function. This bit on the front is just a matrix. So it gives you explicitly L. And then there's some stuff which you don't need to worry about. And you get a Q. And remember, the, the map between K and Q was, was a change of variables that was easy. And so you just change back. And you don't need to worry about that. So this was the centralized solution. It has four easy steps. Right? Change of variables, right? KKT optimality conditions. If you like, this is differentiation. Spectral factorization. This is evil trickery that goes back to Wiener. And then change back the variables. What happens in the decentralized case? We have this additional constraint that k is lower. That changes our convex program to have the additional constraint that q should be lower too, and an h2. Um, and the trick is this trick here, that when you do this change of variables, q is k i minus p22 k inverse z p21, both p22 and p21 are lower. And so q is lower if and only if k is lower. And this is a special case of what people call nested or partially nested systems, or what we called quadratically invariant systems in a slightly different framework. And that trick is what makes a whole bunch of decentralized control problems tractable. Right, so this is a class, right? So this is an example of that class. I've got g1, g2, and g3, three linear systems. K1, K2, and K3, three, op three controllers trying to jointly optimize over K1, K2, and K3. And then these blocks here are delay blocks. So this is a delay of p seconds, and this is a delay of c seconds. And you can read it. Right? So, this K so K1 gets information immediately from G1, 
gets information delayed by, de de uh, by C seconds from, from arrives at K2. Information from G1 delays by 2 C seconds arrives at K3. The delay is pro proportional to the distance down the chain. And there's a little theorem that says that if P is less than or equal to C, uh, then Euler parameterization works. Uh, and I, I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. What happens to the optimality conditions? They become this. M star M N plus M star M times Q has to be an S perp, and Q is an S. The only bit that matters is that this is linear again. Now, what you do to solve this is rather interesting. What you do is you do two spectral factorizations. So this is our optimality condition. M star M plus M star M times Q is an S perp. And M is this, has, is this uh, a 1 by 2 transfer function. So M star is, of course, 2 by 1. And Q has to be lower triangular. We'd like to solve this to for a Q that's an S perp. An S perp is the set of Qs, which are in L2, where the 1, 1, the 2, 1, and the 2, 2 have to be an H2 perp. And the others, because this is 0, this thing can be anything. The perp of 0 is the whole space. So although this looks like there are three equations, that, although this looks like there are four equations, one for each block, there's actually only three equations, because there's no equation corresponding to the 1, 2 block, because that can be anything. So what you do is you split this into its columns. The first column looks like this. The second column looks like this. And uh, these are both of the form of our previous spectral factorization problems. Right, so they both have explicit, explicit spectral factorization solutions. And that gives you Q, which gives you K. And then you invert the Euler parameter, and you get K. And it doesn't matter what it is. OK, I said I'd go through the proof. That was the proof. Um, it has some trickery in it, right? right? There's a bunch of trickery that you need to go through. You need to realize that Euler works for this class of problems. KKT is then straightforward, and then you need to be able to apply two spectral factorizations. And then you'll get an explicit K, um, which has that structure that I said. And then you think, oh my, what have I done? Because right? what you really want to be able to do is not just solve the two-player problem, but the general n-player problem over arbitrary graphs. And it's not so obvious you're going to be able to do all of these things. In particular, you're not going to be able to do this necessarily or this for the general graph case. And then you want to go a little further and say, well, I actually want to do nonlinear systems. And all of this kind of breaks. Okay. So why did we sort of you know, start down this path? And actually, it worked out OK. We actually could do this for general graphs. And I'll tell you what the answer is for general graphs without going through the proof. And now that we know the answer, we can go back to the tools that are easy. Okay. If I give any of you the LQR problem and say, please solve it, well, you're not going to go, go back to Norbert and Norbert Wiener and say, OK, I'm going to spectral factorize away. You're going to go back and do dynamic programming. And we didn't know how to do dynamic programming for this class of problems at all. But now we know what the answer is. We can figure out how to do it. So there was actually some benefit that came out of this that took us beyond what we started doing. We got some hints. Often when you know the answer to a problem, you can solve it. And it's just a question of believing that it's the right answer. So we knew it was the right answer. So that's where this took us. Um, uh, let me give you an example. OK, numerical example with two point masses. It's very simple. Right, I've got two point masses moving in, in the line in one dimension. So I've got a system with four states, position and velocity of each mass. Right, I've got a cost function, which is the average expected value of this thing. Uh, this thing has a big term in it, which is the difference between the positions squared. It has this term in it, in it which is just the sum of the squares of the states. That's going to make the system closed loop stable. That's just some, some regularization stuck in there. And, uh, and then there's this term here, which is some penalty on the effort by the controllers. 
OK, oops. Um, this, by the way, is not my mouse, which is why I keep making mistakes with it and clicking on the wrong button. <laughs> so so, um, so what happens, right? If you do this for, in central, with the centralized optimal LQR controller, this is what it does. Right? At time 50, I'm going to kick the system with a, with a force pulse applied to mass 1. Time 200, I'll kick it with a force pulse applied to mass 2. And at time 300, I'll kick both masses simultaneously. And this is just I'm putting the usual closed loop LQR controller in there and simulating it. And these graphs, the orange curve is the graph of the position of x1 as a function of time. The blue is the graph of the position of x2 as a function of time. And the black is the difference between their positions. Now this is what happens. At time 50, you kick mass 1, and mass 2 goes chasing after it. At time 200, you kick mass 2, and mass 1 goes chasing after it. They're trying to keep close to each other because of this. And then at time 300, you kick both the masses, and they both go off together. And they don't spend much effort coming back to the origin, because that's a much smaller penalty in the cost than this one. So it does exactly what you expect it to do in the centralized case. In the decentralized case, something kind of interesting happens. Right? So remember how the information goes. Right? Information flows from left to right. right? Player 1 only knows about the behavior of system 1. And player 2 knows about the behavior of system 1 and system 2. So player 2 is getting both states. Player 1 is only getting the state of system 1. We kick system 1. Player 2 knows about it and goes chasing off after it. And this graph is exactly that graph. It does exactly what the centralized optimal does. At time 200, we kick system 2. Right? Player 1 doesn't know. So player one has this orange curve, which goes cruising off back to the origin. It doesn't even notice. Right? Player two gets kicked, but then he pushes really hard to come back to the origin kind of quickly. Because player two knows that player one is not reacting. Right? So player two reacts for him. And then at time 300, we kick both of them, and they do something. Okay. So this is all kind of interesting right here. Player 2 is making up for player 1. So how much difference do you think you get in performance between a decentralized system like this and the centralized system? So there's quite different information patterns, right? Player 1 knows half as much as he used to. Uh, oh, I should show you this, this plot. Right? This, these are the kicks. These are the, four, these are the inputs. that are, These are not the kicks, sorry. These are the, the controller responses. These are the actions that are applied, the force actions that are applied by the controllers. And again, orange is system one. You, should, you can see that uh, player one doesn't do anything, and player two works extra hard to make up for that. How much difference in performance in there? Well, not much. Right? So this plot, remember the cost function, as a big term, which is the difference in, in the positions squared, and a small term, which is the effort. And then you can change how much effort you put in by changing this number 10 and plot a trade-off curve. And that's what we do. Right, so this is that trade-off curve between the mean square relative position error and the mean square effort. Okay. And, ooh. and there is not a great deal of difference. The black curve is the decentralized one. And the orange curve is the centralized one and does a little bit better. So for a fixed amount of error, there's a significant effort difference. Right? If you slice vertically, there's a big gap between these curves. Right? But if you slice horizontally and look at the uh, fixed amount of effort, there's not much difference in error. And overall, these graphs are rather close to each other. Decentralization doesn't cost you much. Right? So if you're thinking physically and building a system, you might like to em emit that communication channel if you can do a good control design. Or emit that sensor if you can do a good control design, depending on how it's set up. So if you've actually got dollars in mind, that's not a bad choice. Um, uh, something interesting happens if you look at this effort and think about this effort as having two bits to it. Right? There's the sum of the square. This effort is the sum of the squares of u1 and u2. Right, so it's the, it's, U, it's the average of u1 squared plus the average of u2 squared. And in the decentralized case, it splits. So I've just do, done uh, sections here. And so this, 
blue is the amount of effort that's the average of u2 squared, and this, this light blue is the amount of effort that's the average of u1 squared. So in the centralized case, of course, both bars are equal. This half of this bar is dark blue and half of it's light blue. Both players have to work equally hard. In the decentralized case, player two makes up for player one. Which is kind of a nice interpretation of what's happening. But, and you can see that the workload ratio is actually about the same no matter where on this curve you are. It's about three and a half. And, uh, I don't know why that is. OK. Um, uh, so what have I wrote down so far? We found the optimal state space solution to a simple two-player network. OK. There's an estimator that's required for both systems. Right? It's not just classical certainty equivalence. It's not just the classical separation principle. It's a different separation principle. It's a decentralized separation principle, if you like. And the optimal controller order, both players have states. Both players have memory. Right. We can actually do this for some more complex networks. And we can do this for some output feedback cases as well. I've just done state feedback. It was all simple. I can't do every network, and I can't do every output feedback problem. There are problems where I know the optimal is linear and rational, but I don't know what the structure of the controller is. Uh, let's look at more general graphs. Let's see what the structure looks like there. OK, so I, I can look at a specific class of graphs. Right? And these are the graphs which are transitively closed. So I've got a directed acyclic graph. And transitively closed means that because there's a path from v1 to v3, there's an edge from v1 to v3 too. So these are the graphs that correspond to partial orders on the vertices. Um, so I can only do transitively closed graphs. And what I mean by that is that the set of allowable controllers has to have a sparsity pattern corresponding to a transitively closed graph. Right? This is the set of constraints for which I can solve optimal controllers. Uh, they, they look kind of boring, but there are actually some interesting ones. Here are all of them of, of degree 4. Um, and you can see there are some sort of odd ones. Um, there's, you know, there's the broadcast, and then there's the opposite of broadcast. Um, and then there are, of course, you know, things like this, which are obvious little trees. And um, so there are some interesting four-node graphs, even though you think they have to be transitively closed. That makes them kind of boring. Tangent yes. Uh, corner right. Corner right. I don't want to, I don't oh, it's want to not. I didn't draw. I didn't draw the closure. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this, it's the, all, of, all the closure of these graphs. And this, so this generates every possible transitively closed graph. Okay. Yes, so what I mean by this is that, so I'm going to have the following situation. I'm going to allow my controller to transmit information according to transitively closed graphs. Right? And then I'm going to have dynamics, which also has to fit within the sparsity of the transitively closed graphs. Right? So if I've got a, a graph like this, this means that x1, this is t plus 1, has to be some function of x1 plus some function of u1. x2 it has an input which is u1, so it has uh, dynamics which are a function of x2. Oh, this should be x1 here. Um, and similarly, x3 here has some dynamics which are function by of x1 and x2 here, as well as x3. So these f's are the coupling terms between systems, the a's are the internal dynamics, and the b's are just the controller inputs. This is just an example. They don't have to be identical on every, every node. And I can have more inputs. So just like this system, the time update of system 3, the state of system 3 is affected by x1 and x2, it could also be affected by u1 and u2. Right? So we've got some generality in our class of allowable systems. <coughs> Specifically, I've got a transitively closed graph. I've got these dynamics. And a and b have to have the sparsity of g. I've got my usual LQR cost. Uh, this, this is correct. I'm going to have a controller K, which is required to have the sparsity of G. You can prove, due to some work we did a few years ago, um, and in fact, due to some earlier work too, that the optimal controller is always linear. Uh, we proved that it's always rational. The set of uh, closed loop maps is always is convex. Uh, and the question is, what does it look like? Who's estimating what? Uh, let's do an example. This is the chain. 
Right? The optimal policy looks like this. Right, U1 is some matrix times these things. Uh, X1, the estimate of X2 given X1, and the estimate of X3 given X1. These are all things that player 1 can compute, because he knows the state of system 1. These are just the estimates of the other states. Right? U2, well, it's the second row of this, so it depends on, those, on, on these, th these things too. Player 2 can compute that, because he gets the information from system 1. But then it's got some additional stuff in there, some matrix times these things. And this is an estimation error. x2 minus the estimate of x2 given x1. And x3 estimated conditioned on systems 1 and 2 minus x3 estimated conditioned on just system 1. It's a weird structure. Right, this is an estimation error. Um, the difference between having the information available to system 2 and not having it. And that's what it is. And similarly for x3 and player 3. And this is in which each of these, these hats corresponds to running a little Kalman filter. If each player has to run a Kalman filter like this, then player 1 is going to have n2 plus n3 states. Player 2 and player 3 are going to both going to have n2 plus 2 n3 states. Right, so for example, for player 3, this is uh, an n3 state to compute this quantity, which is the same as this one. And this thing is another n3 state, which is the same as this one. And then there's n2 states as well, um, which is for this one, which player 3 needs to know, which is the same as this one. Um, I don't think that's obvious. Uh, you can work out other graphs too, and this is another example where, in this case, everybody ha has the same number of states. Uh, and just uh, there's a general result here, which, uh, you know, just to tell you that there is a formula in terms of ancestors and descendants of, of, of a particular node on the graph, and uh, it's, it's not particularly obvious, so I'm not going to interpret it. Okay, uh, I have a little bit of time, right? I suppose, yes. Yeah. Okay, so I, w I want to just give you a few little bits of, without any proofs and without any formal statements, of what the, what the results are for nonlinear systems or for Markov decision processes. Um, and they go like this. Okay, I've got a two player system. Right? Uh, so it's a Markov decision process, or if you prefer, nonlinear difference equation. Um, so x at t plus 1, x1 at t plus 1 is some function of the previous x1. Um, the input u1 and uh, some noise w1, which is iid. And the state of system 2 updates according to some function of x1 and x2. u1 and u2, these are the control inputs, and some noise. So this is the triangular, this is the nonlinear variant of the triangular system. First case. What does the optimal controller look like? Same block diagram, I've just drawn it in this little information flowing from left to right block diagram as well. Same information structure on the controller. Um, uh, the optimal centralized controller is again static because it's an MDP. <coughs> the decentralized heuristic is the same. Pick some, pick some uh, function of x1 and the belief state of x2 given x1. This is the probability distribution of x2 given x1. And just you player 2 use the, uh, the centralized optimal. Right? And you might even optimize over gamma 1 hat here and look at all possible functions like this. And you can still be arbitrarily worse than the true, than the true optimal controller. And the right one has this structure. <coughs> player 1's input is a function of x1 and the belief state, and player 2's input is a function of x1, x2, and the belief state. Okay. Both players have to run the belief state, the nonlinear Stratonovich filter um, for system 2 given system 1. They could, com they could send it to each other if they wanted it to, sure. Yeah. So, yeah, they could communicate. Um, and this input, the, inf the interpretation is the same. Note that this doesn't depend on the history of x2 or x1. So there's an explicit class of functions. If you've got some arbitrary decentralized problem, 
arbitrary nonlinear dynamics, arbitrary separable expected cost. This tells you what you should be estimating, how you should be structuring your belief states and your optimal controller. Um, uh, one more example. Um, here's a, a star topology example. Um, I've got a central node that just is like before, and I've got outer nodes which are each affected by, by the central node and none of the others. And the, the optimal policy looks like this. And this is interesting because the central node, of course, has a belief state for each of the outer guys. And the outer nodes have the same belief state, so they all have the same number of states. But you don't need a joint belief state. So you don't need to compute a joint distribution of x3, x4, x5, and x2, conditioned x1. You just need to the, the marginal distributions. So it's much smaller than you think it would be given the previous result. It's a structural result on the optimal controllers. It doesn't depend on the dynamics. Now I did this graph. And I talked earlier about transitively closed graphs. I can't do this for arbitrary nonlinear systems on transitively closed graphs. And I don't know what the answer is there. You can only do the nonlinear case in certain graphs. And this is one. Um, OK, conclusions. Um, decentralized LQR, I gave you state space solutions. <coughs> A wide variety of systems. It's not classical certainty equivalence. In the two player case, we know there's a number of states. In the n-player case, for transitively closed graphs, we know the number of states, we know the structure, we know who should estimate what. For MDPs, we know the structure, again, for some graphs and not all of them. And I'll stop there. Yes, so that's actually quite magic. Um, so you know, I did this proof using spectral factorization. There is no probability in that proof at all. Right? And then I expressed the answer probabilistically. So that's, a, that's an interpretation of the result. I mean, it is that, but we worked out it was that afterwards. We proved that this, uh, we, we, OK, we got this state space realization for the optimal controller. What do the states mean, we asked ourselves. We worked out that the states were actually that. Um, now, when you do it in biodynamic programming, you actually get for free the interpretation of the states. But we can still do some cases via spectral factorization that we can't do via DP. In those cases, we don't know what the states are. So we can do some output feedback cases. And then you get additional states, not just those, those belief states, but some other states in the controllers as well. The controllers are dynamic with these additional states, and we don't know what they are. Okay. We know they're right, but we don't know what they are. So you get, you get cases where you, you have a for factorization. Yeah, I don't know what to label the states. Okay. Yeah. So we can't. So how do you dynamically? What do you condition? <laughs> yeah, it's a bit evil. Uh, uh, um, uh, it's actually not very easy to answer that. So uh, it took us a long time to, to get the dynamic programming right. And we started by trying to prove this by dynamic programming. And we tried all sorts of clever tricks. And before we knew the answer, we couldn't do it. And so then we got this spectral factorization result. Then we got dynamic programming to work. And then we extended it to nonlinear systems. But, uh, but as you say, you, it, it's not obvious because you have to condition on something. And then that would mean that all players have that thing, information that you're conditioning on. And the trick is, is that you don't, it doesn't work quite like that. The, the optimization variables are no longer just the player actions. There are additional variables that you throw in. So it's dynamic programming, but with some clever change of variables that you throw on top of it. Nothing to, no, no. Other questions? 
Petros. So can you just uh, elaborate again on the output? If you, okay, here you have state defect, right? Yeah. So if you have output defect, you say, uh, I don't recall what was the result, you can't really. I can do it sometimes. I can give you explicit formulae sometimes. Yeah. But what exactly breaks down? Uh, uh, I can tell you. Uh, I think. Can't you just uh, have a structure which is like a state defect with some generalized? I don't know which slide it is. Hang on. <laughs> uh, uh, that's centralized, decentralized. All right, sorry, you were saying. You were saying, can I just have a structure which is? Yeah, so maybe state feedback with some, some generalized estimation. Yeah, so this, this breaks. Right? So we do this, this tricky thing, uh, which is uh, doing, converting this, this, this problem here into two spectral factorizations. In the output feedback case, it doesn't work in general. And the, in, and the, the uh, because in the output feedback case, of course, you've got a, a four block problem. You've got a right hand block there. And that means that the optimality conditions become complicated, and that means that they don't split. Now, in some output feedback problems, they do split. But it should be the case that if I give you a triangular two-player system, player one measures y1, player two measures y2, you should be able to write down state space formula for the optimal controller. You should know how many states there are, and we don't know either of those things. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Uh, so in the linear case, we've proved it. Uh, in the nonlinear case, I just believe it. I haven't done it. Um, and I doubt if we'll do it. So but, you know, somebody else can handle that measure theory. Um, yeah. Going back to uh, dynamic programming, when you mentioned that, I, I have a picture in my mind that you were, um, had some insight about value functions or cost functions. Yes, we know what the value function is. And uh, it's, it's somewhat like I was saying to Srikant. There's a change of variables that you use that's not obvious. And, uh, uh, and what the value function should be a function of is not clear a priori, right? Because if it's a function of both states, then both players would need to know both states. If it's a function of just one state, then the players don't know anything else. So the value function is rather tricky. And uh, 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 I, I don't know that I can give a, uh, an explicit answer in words as to what it is, other than there's a trick. Oh, yes, it's my pleasure. Oh, thank you for that. coming. Well, thank it's you. Nice to speak with you.